Russian rocket fire. Down with U.S. Empire. No more Russian rocket fire. Down with U.S. Empire. All of these trials uh, do not, their trials, all of the 81 trials do not meet any standards that uh, acceptable around the world. Uh, and the Saudi courts obviously do not have uh, the processes that you can consider to be fair or legal in, in any country. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. We'll start with an Israeli killing of a 19-month-old girl. Fatima al-Masri lived with her family in Gaza, an area under various levels of Israeli-U.S. siege for 15 years. She had a serious heart condition that could not be treated in the Gaza Strip, so her family applied to Israel for permission to go to Jerusalem. And they waited. And they waited. Israel demands that all requests to go to Jerusalem from Palestinians in Gaza go to a body it calls the Coordination and Liaison Administration. This body reviews all requests. The al Masri family waited for five months and so missed an appointment in December and another one in February. Fatima al Masri died of bureaucratic murder on March 25th. May one day the names of the people who killed her through neglect be revealed. By the way, most Palestinian children who have cancer are allowed to go to Jerusalem, but their parents are not allowed to go with them. They either go alone for cancer treatment or they can have one grandparent go with them. And people wonder why Palestinians are angry at Israelis. Now to the first part of a march and rally for Ukraine in New Haven on April 1st. Um, I'm Evan. I'm a member of Workers Voice, uh, part of the coalition that helped plan today's action and plan the uh, March 6th action down the street. Um, here to say uh, that we stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian resistance to uh, the Russian invasion and uh, as well as standing against uh, the United States using using the war to uh, increase its own standing and uh, further hurt Ukrainian and other, other peoples. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker today, who's Alexander Kuzma, the Chief Development Officer of the Ukrainian Catholic University Foundation. Uh, he's a lawyer by training for 15 years, and he served as a Development Director for the Children of Chernobyl Relief Fund. Uh, he has been a spokesperson for the Ukrainian community in Connecticut since the start of the February invasion. Uh, give him a round of applause. Whoa! Yay! So Okay, uh, Slava Ukraini. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out in solidarity with Ukraine today. I know it's a blustery, cold, rainy day, but that just goes to show you that uh, peace activists can be very tough uh, regardless of the weather conditions. So it's, it's my honor to be here with you today and to thank you for, on behalf of the people of Ukraine and the Ukrainian American community, we've really been moved by just how strong the support has been for um, Ukraine during this terribly trying time when so many people are being killed by Putin's fascists and uh, Putin's war criminals. Um, I think it's really important for people to stand up against this kind of tyranny and this kind of aggression that was totally un unprovoked and totally unjustified under every un under every circumstance. Um, I, I've had the, the pleasure of working and living in Ukraine for a number of years and uh, working first with the Children of Chernobyl Relief Fund and then actually having worked uh, with promoting enduring peace. Uh, my dear dearly departed, sad, sadly they're no longer with us, but Lou and Judy Friedman, my dear friends who used to be with uh, PEP for many years and Howard and Alice Frazier, um, we actually went on a, a, a river cruise down the Dnipro River from Kiev all the way down to Odessa uh, back in 1991, just a few weeks before Ukraine declared its independence. 
on, uh, on August 24th of 1991. And it was an epic journey. It was something that was deeply moving because I, it was the first time that I really had an opportunity to meet people from all up and down Ukraine, um, from Kiev all the way down to Odessa, many of the areas that are currently under attack and under, under bombardment by, by the Russian troops. And so it's, it's really heartbreaking to see just how um, how monstrous this campaign of aggression has been over the past month and, and change. And, um, you know, it's, it's really very powerful to see the resistance of the Ukrainian people, how they really stood up against this, this incredible invasion. Uh, they've been incredibly creative in the way that they've countered this aggression. And they've really resisted everybody from the youngest young people to uh, to the elderly ladies, the babushi, you all know the famous story about the lady with the sunflowers, right, who, uh, who uh, told the guys just to go home or end up uh, buried along with the sunflower seeds and maybe something good will come of them. But it's really important for, for people that are promoting peace and people that are promoting justice around the world to understand how important Ukraine has been all these years because, you know, Ukraine is not only the breadbasket of Europe, but it's also been an engine of of economic revitalization of Eastern Europe and also working on, on technology development all over the world. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Ukraine has already undergone a horrible genocide back in the 1930s during the Stalin era when Joseph Stalin confiscated the grain from the, uh, from the Ukrainian countryside and blocked humanitarian shipments and basically exported this grain around the world to build up hard currency for his industrialization campaign. And this was a monstrous uh, act of genocide. It led to the, to the starvation of over up to 10 million people, according to some estimates, including uh, Stalin himself actually declared to Churchill and to, um, and to Khrushchev that he, had, he believed that he had killed 10 million people as a result of this famine. So this is not the first time that the Russian um, oligarchs and the Russian uh, you know, monsters have, have really come in and tried to destroy, uh, destroy Ukraine's will to live and, and if the questions it's, its right to existence. Um, so we're now seeing the potential for this to turn into a second genocide um, in, in Ukraine because the, the troops that are, are now laying siege to Mariupol, to Melitopol, to Kherson, to Kiev itself, to Kharkiv. Um, you know, when Putin says, says that he was out there, his justification, he claimed, was that he was trying to protect the Russian-speaking people. It's the Russian-speaking people in Kharkiv and, and Mariupol that he's bombing to high heaven. And so this is a complete ruse. The Russians uh, that live in Ukraine will tell you, first off, many of them who are ethnic Russians or, or come from Russian roots are defending Ukraine against Russian aggression. And that's, it's so important for people to understand that that is a complete lie as basically Putin is a, a consummate liar and somebody who's you know, not just a pathological killer, but also somebody that's tried to, to delude the whole world. And unfortunately, here in the United States, we have people like Tucker Carlson and Mike Pompeo and a certain former president that will remain nameless because uh, that are trying to basically support the Russian war effort and, and are basically praising Putin. Uh, this is outrageous. We need uh, the United States needs to speak out against people like like uh, Putin and and also speak out against people like Tucker Carlson and Pompeo and Giuliani and all the other people that were trying to manipulate the Ukrainian people uh, um, in in their hour of need. But I think it's also important for people to realize that this is a threat to world peace because Ukraine is one of the top suppliers of foodstuffs anywhere in the world. Um, Ukraine is among the top five producers and exporters of wheat. Barley, sunflower oil, maize, soy, uh, you just right down the line, sugar from sugar beets. Um, there are many countries around the world like Yemen and South Sudan that are counting on Ukraine to produce bumper crops of, of uh, foodstuffs. And right now those folks can't even produce food because they're out on the front lines fighting against the Russian invasion. This is gonna lead to massive hunger all around the world. So I'm really asking all of you to stand up, to, to write to Fox News, to condemn them for, for their failure to uh, condemn Tucker Carlson and his rooting for Putin idiocy. Um, you know, it's high time that people realize just, just what, what these people represent. Also, um, I just wanted to urge everybody here to this evening, there's gonna be a program at eight o'clock on channel eight, ch channel nine, um, called Crisis in Ukraine. Um, 
and there are going to be a number of performances by uh, Ukrainian artists and performing artists and we'd love to have you to uh, join that uh, to, to uh, view that and to comment to thank Channel 8 and Channel 9 for their excellent coverage of this but it's really important for people to speak out against genocide and to contact our um, our, our uh, congressional representatives Rosa DeLauro for the most part they've been very good on this issue um, Chris Murphy's been to Ukraine num numerous times he's actually visited our university he's been really good on this issue but we need them to speak out against against any kind of genocide and to make sure that Ukraine has provided the humanitarian corridors that they need to survive these sieges and also to create a no-fly zone because they've got to be able to prevent these bombardments from happening. So we're really urging people to, to reach out to their congressional reps and to demand that the United States uh, stand with the people of Ukraine and provide them with the cr crucial humanitarian aid they need. Thank you very much. Solidarity with Ukraine, in a violence of pain. Solidarity with Ukraine, in a violence of pain. Stop bombing Ukraine. Stop bombing Ukraine. Stop bombing Syria. No more Russian rocket fire. Down with USN fire. No more Russian rocket fire. Down with USN fire. No more Russian rocket fire. Down with USN fire. No more Russian rocket fire. Susan Booth, who we had on the program last week, spoke to the marchers about the work her group Archway Romania is doing to help Ukrainian refugees. So Jika, who's my guy over there, who's my guy over there, said, Susan, you're going to be angry at us, but we cleaned out the storerooms and we put everything in the van and took them up to Odessa. And we got the street kids to come with us. They helped pass them out. They wouldn't get close to any of the border guards because they have no papers. And, and we're doing everything we can over there. The point of this whole thing is these kids, these kids that we help at Archway, have nothing. They're street children that were abandoned, put out by their parents because they couldn't afford to feed them right after Ceausescu was assassinated. So here they are. They're giving away the stuff that we've gotten for them to people that they don't know. And that, to me, is pretty amazing. The people united can end this war. The people united and we can chant um We celebrate the brave Russians who are taking to the streets in protest against their government's actions, yeah. risking not only arrest, but in many cases their lives. We wish our fellow citizens would follow their example to protest our own government's ongoing military incursions throughout the rest of the world. We stand with the brave and suffering people of Ukraine. Stop Putin's war from Syria to Ukraine. Stop Putin's war from Syria to Ukraine. Stop Putin's war from Syria to Ukraine. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Subi. Uh, I'm from, I represent the New Ever Young Lords. You hear me now? Okay, there you go. Um, I'm not Ukrainian. I'm not Syrian. I'm um, not from Palestine. I'm Puerto Rican. Um, coming from Puerto Rico, I can understand and I feel for the people of Ukraine because I know what it is to be invaded. Uh, not once, but twice. You know? Okay. Not once, but twice. What's going on? now around the world if you guys look back historically 50 years ago and go through all the newspapers from cuba palestine ukraine yo it's happening all over again go look at the history go look at the newspaper articles go back to the 60s late 60s everything's happening all over again what goes around comes back around we're living through it once again 
So it's time for us to do what we did then and stand up together, united. Like everybody's saying, united, we, we will not be divided, right? We gotta start doing that and start really living that method. Everyone has to understand each and every individual struggle to be able to stand with one another. If we don't start showing up for other people's problems, nobody's gonna show up for ours. Nobody's gonna care on what's going on in Puerto Rico, Cuba, Ukraine, Syria, Palestine. Half the people don't even care now. Why? Because they're in their own world. So it's time for us to start waking up the people and letting them know that we don't start now. What you think happened in Ukraine? What you think is gonna happen here? What's happening in other places, other territories that are becoming third world countries at this point? I just wanna end it with that, leave it with that. I appreciate everybody's time. More on the march on next week's program. In a program we filmed before the Russian invasion, we criticized the corporate media for showing pictures of a Ukrainian Special Forces unit training civilians in Mariupol, in particular a grandmother in how to shoot a rifle. That wasn't a problem, but what they failed to mention was that the soldier shown was wearing the patch of the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion. Well, now Newsweek has found the reverse. A Russian soldier wearing a Nazi patch getting an award for killing 250 so-called Nazis in Ukraine. Now, the message we support on Ukraine is defeat Putin fascism, but that doesn't mean we necessarily withhold criticism from Ukrainian government leaders, in particular its president, Zelensky. For one thing, he outlawed a slew of political parties that were supposedly pro-Russian. The Ukrainian group Solzhenitsyn Ruk, which translates as social movement, which opposes all these parties politically, still spoke out against banning them, saying there was no evidence given to a court or to the public that the parties involved were involved with treason or sabotage. It further said, we'd like to warn against any attempts to stigmatize left and social movements in general by the absurd linking of the progressive agenda to the Kremlin, which actually embodies everything opposite to it. Left and union activists today are fighting the aggressor as members of the military force and territorial defense and as volunteers. There's also the problem of Zelensky's support for Israel. Two years ago, the Ukrainian government withdrew from the UN Committee on the Rights of Palestinian People. Since the Russian invasion, Israel hasn't sent Ukraine any weapons or participated in any sanctions. It had to be drag kicking and screaming to make any small gestures on behalf of Ukraine. Its Prime Minister Naftali Bennett rushed to Moscow to sit with Putin to see if he could act as a mediator. This week after the Butcha war crimes were uncovered, Israeli Finance Minister Lieberman had the gall to say, these are difficult images and we all condemn war crimes. At the same time, there are mutual accusations, meaning who knows whom to believe. The Ukrainian ambassador to Israel answered him and offered to take Lieberman to Butcha to see the bodies so he would know who was responsible. Despite all this, Zelensky on April 5th said, we will become a big Israel with its own face at a briefing for Ukrainian media. Now, it's one thing to say that Ukraine will have to have more security after the war, but to say that Ukraine should model itself after apartheid Israel is not only an insult to the Palestinians, but it gives Putin propagandists a big Peg to hang on. 
We mentioned last week plans for a union rally for Ukraine in London. Here again is the graphic with logos added of supporting unions. And in the U.S., the group Workers' Voice has started to connect up with an independent Ukrainian miners' union. For more about that, go to workersvoiceus.org. These are pictures from al rukban in Syria, near the Iraq and Jordanian borders, and the U.S. Tanf military base in Syria. Tens of thousands of people are living there, families of Syrians who helped the U.S. fight ISIS, and others who ran away from Assad-dominated areas. The area is surrounded by Russian, Iranian, and Assad forces. Although Rukban is within the self, self-proclaimed U.S. security zone, the U.S. won't supply the people there with food or water. Though the U.S. sends every manner of weapons to fight Russians in Ukraine, it won't even send a load of flour to Syrians surrounded by Russians in Syria. On March 12th, the Saudi government executed 81 people in one day. We'll spend the balance of the program talking to Saudi dissident Ali al-Ahmed about the background to that mass execution. A Saudi researcher and human rights activist, he's a regular guest on CBS News, CNN, PBS, Al Jazeera, and others. He's speaking to us from Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for having me. On March 12th, Saudi officials executed 81 people in one day. You tweeted about it. You said 40 or so were activists who had merely taken part in protests. Could you explain? Yes, uh, the uh, the majority of the uh, of those who are fifty percent uh, or more uh, uh, are Shia Arabs. Uh, uh, Forty of them were arrested uh, on charges of protesting uh, against the government. Uh, one was accused of spying because he, you know, he he had a visit uh, or invited an Iranian diplomat over for for dinner because he lived nearby. Uh, so uh, the rest uh, were mixed of Yemenis who are against the war or uh, and other militants from uh, supposedly ISIS who were uh, accused of bombing uh, and fighting with the Saudi forces. Uh, all of these trials uh, do not, their trials, all of the 81 trials do not meet any standards that uh, acceptable around the world. Uh, and the Saudi courts obviously do not have uh, the processes that you can consider to be fair or legal in, in any country, uh, basically in any other country around the world. Uh, the, the mass execution came on the orders of Mohammed bin Salman himself. Such uh, a mass execution cannot be carried out on an order uh, of uh, a, a minister it has to come from the uh, from the king or the royal court, and uh, as the king is not uh, able to conduct his his duties, uh, like everybody knows, because of his age and illness, it is MBS who had decided uh, to carry on and order these these, these uh, unnecessary, really, uh, executions. Uh, and uh, like I said, you know, the, most of these people w- were uh, executed for their opinions or for protests, not for anything. Most of them did not kill anyone. Most of them, even the, even those who are accused uh, of being uh, uh, I, uh, members of ISIS. Now, you mentioned Shia. I, I think many of our viewers would be surprised. They, they s- tend to think Saudi Arabia, Wahhabi, or Sunni. Um, what percent of the people are Shia? Well, it's very hard to say, but in my uh, own research, I think uh, between 20 to 25 percent 
we have a problem that Saudi Arabia is a, is a closed country in terms of the freedom of, inf of information, freedom of research, and, inf and also in freedom of religion. For example, I have written this over 20 years ago when I found that there are many Shia in, in Saudi Arabia who do not, uh, 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 who hide their faith because they live in uh, areas where being Shia uh, makes you a target and deprives you from economic uh, and educational opportunities. So many people hide their faith uh, outside the, the traditional Shia areas in the East and uh, some in the West. Outside these regions, people tend to hide the fact that they are Shia Muslims. Because and the general uh, attitude of the government and uh, the leaders of the Saudi Arabia the is Saudi intolerant. State, the Saudi state uh, uh, is, without a doubt, is an anti-Shia uh, state. Uh, from the king, MBS, and uh, the entire sort of uh, Saudi elite, uh, basically, because they view Shia as a threat, and that's something they have said in public. And privately, so it, this is there is no doubt about this. This is like day day and night. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, this has not been um, talked about very much in the West because you know it's one of our allies and they, they, that's their culture and so on. So this idea that Saudi Arabia, uh, the, the state, is a tolerant uh, uh, government toward its citizens is not true. Uh, Shia is, a, I think, is a prime example of that. Because if you are a Shia, you cannot e uh, even be a mayor. There is not a single mayor in Saudi Arabia who is a Shia, or a, let alone a minister or a judge or, a, or uh, even like a military officer or a pilot, military pilot. It's not allowed. It's in the Saudi system. It's not been published, but we know it exists because we, we have access to these sort of secret regulations that they, that they have in the Saudi state that that says that Saudi Shia are not allowed to occupy these positions. Uh, and I'll give you a very simple example. The Saudi embassy in Washington, DC was opened in 1948. Since 1948 until 2022, there hasn't been a single Shia uh, Saudi in that embassy who worked as a diplomat, zero, zilch. That's our program for today. Come and see us again next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.